uh, I think we can start. So. Yeah, maybe, maybe we'll, we'll, uh, we'll give it a couple minutes, minutes uh, just, uh, just in case we are. Okay. Welcome, welcome everybody. My name is Travis Burrow. I will be your session, session chair for uh, this, this session on software, software security. Six. We will be starting in just, just a couple minutes. Are there noise on your voice, Travis? Is it from my side or? Uh, I think I can also hear that there's some I think, I think, I think it's my side. So when, so when I unmute, you, do you hear the noise? Or do you hear it all the time? Uh, when you speak, like it's hard to understand what you're. Do you still hear noise? No, it's clear now. Excellent. Well, we've managed to pick up one extra attendee, so why don't we go ahead and get started? So thank you everyone for joining uh, the session on software security six. We have six presentations today. So the plan is to um, invite everybody to present in order for five minutes. And then if you can hold your questions till after every presentation is finished, we will proceed to an open Q&A, um, at which time you can unmute your microphone or pass your question through chat. We will be monitoring. And uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so our first presentation will be by Bowden Chintanet, and he will be presenting his paper, Lags in the Release, Adoption, and Propagation of NPM Vulnerability Fixes. Bowden, feel free to share your screen. Okay, thank you, Travis, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bodin Chintanet from Nara Institute of Science and Technology, Japan. Today, I will present our uh, general first paper, Lags in the Release, Adoption, and Propagation of NPM Vulnerability Fixes. So as you may know, security vulnerability is a growing concern for developers as the risk it poses is not only affect to the direct clients, but is also cascaded transitively across the ecosystem. To mitigate the risk from the vulnerabilities, developers need to adopt the, the vulnerability fix quickly. However, 
there's only few works specifically looking at uh, the vulnerability fix and its lag during the propagation across the ecosystem. So in our study, we do an empirical analysis to identify and characterize lags in vulnerability fixing process. So here we use libraries and vulnerability, which is one of the biggest package ecosystem in the world. So from here, I will briefly explain about our analysis and results. So first, when uh, developers know that their package is vulnerable, they have to work on fixing a vulnerability and then they might make a fixing commit and later on they release it as a fixing release, which in this case is the new version called version 1.1.1. And during this process, we suspect that there is a potential lag in the fixing process. So we manually investigate uh, at the commit level and lie level. And here we found that the fixing release usually bundle with unrelated commits. And further than that, we found that there is just only around 10 lines of code that actually relate, actually related to the vulnerability fixes. Then let's move to the next level, which is the direct client of a vulnerable package. So as you can see here, that uh, the package A release a patch to fix a vulnerability. And then let's consider in the client side. So here there is a potential lag in the fix adoption as uh, the developers have to adopt a bigger change because in client B, uh, they didn't update their dependency. So in this case, if they want to adopt the vulnerability, the vulnerability fixes, they have to make a minor change. So here we investigate this kind of lags in the fixed adoption by looking at the version changes. And here we found that patches from a vulnerable package are usually adopted as a minor landing by clients, which means that clients keep outdated dependency, so they have to spend more migration effort due to the potential risk from backward incompatible changes. And then let's move to the another level, which is the transitive clients. So in this case, client C cannot uh, adopt the fix directly and are forced to wait for auto packages in their library supply chain to adopt the fix first. So we suspect that uh, there's some factor that might influence these kind of lags. So in this study, we look at two factors, which is severity of vulnerability and linear freshness, which refer to the version branch that the fix was released. So here we found that these factors influence lags with the lineage freshness, uh, with the latest lineage and medium severity suffered the most lags. So here is the lesson learned from our study. So first, the release cycle matter. There is a need for strategies to make the efficient update to reduce lags. Second, migration cost effort. If developers keep the stale libraries, it might increase the chance of backward incompatible changes. So here we suggest that developers should frequently update the libraries in order to reduce the lags. And third, awareness of fixes is important to allow quicker planning of update. Even though downstream clients cannot directly adopt the fix from libraries, however, they could prepare themselves so the lags from migration, the new version <clears throat> from the upstream package is minimum. And thanks for your attention. And please feel free to check our replication artifact and full papers here. Thank you. 
Great, thank you, Paulan. <clears throat> Next up, we have Senon Wang, who will be presenting APER, Evolution Aware Runtime Permission Misuse Detection for Android apps. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, let's show my screen. Okay. I can see your slide. All right, now, so let's start. Mm, hello, everyone. This is. Did we lose Sinan? Yeah, I think so. Um, Sinan, we cannot hear you. Are you muted? His video is showing. Mm, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Do you want to try again? Oh, sorry. Um, since I'm mute my microphone, just now. Um, so can I continue? Uh, please continue. Oh, okay, sorry. Mm, uh, I will start from okay, maybe this slide. Okay. Mm, we all know that privacy and security issues is essential for mobile software users, and that's why Android has a permission model for protecting user data and system resources. Mm, before the Android version 6.0, in order to install an app, the user must accept all the um, required permission at when it is installed. And, uh, more, and this permission cannot be revoked after the app is, is installed. And so this static permission model is not secure enough, and so it was replaced by the runtime permission model since 6.0. And under this new model, the app should request permissions at runtime instead of the install time, and the user can revoke the granted permission once it is installed. And so this change of permission model can improve the privacy, but it needs more programming efforts to maintain to maintain the permissions. And so if an app wants to obtain some sensitive data like location or contact, it, it should call some Android APIs that needs permissions, and we call them the dangerous APIs. And the Android, this is the official dangerous documentation. It will write an an API or master we need which kind of permissions. Just like this API, the request location update, it requires either of the cost location or the file location permissions. And then an app needs the series of operations to maintain the permissions. There are five steps involved in the permission management. And among them, the most important one is the check permission, uh, the check API, it will tell whether a permission has been granted by the user. And so without this step, a dangerous API can be called without uh, granting the corresponding permission and thus cause some abnormal behaviors. Under the runtime permission model, developers should write more code to maintain the permissions and more code means much easier to cause bugs. We call these bugs as ARP bugs and ARP issues. We in our work, we classify two types of ARP issues. They are type one, which is related to missing permission check, and type two, which is related to incompatibility use. And uh, how can we detect these bugs accurately? We figure out there are two major challenges. The first challenge is that we should properly maintain the asynchronous permission management and usages. Uh, if you know how to, uh, Android development, you might know Android program has multiple entry points for Mm, multiple entry, entry points, and these entry points are called asynchronously. And such programming style allow the user of uh, allow the developers to write their permission management code and the permission use code far apart. And as a result, user can revoke permission between these asynchronous callbacks. Mm, another challenge is about permission uh, evolution. For example, during the evolution of Android. A dangerous API will be added or removed, or their the required permission can be changed. 
And also the permission mechanism itself is evolving. So an accurate detector should take this problem into account. So let's move to our true design. Our true APR is a purely static detector. Uh, we define the, to detect ARP issue in an Android app, we define the following four types of permission management in the method call graph. Mm, let's take the intro procedure case as an example in which the permission check API and the permission use that's the dangerous API is called from the same method. And that's uh, it's the intro procedure permission management and usages. Mm, for these two methods, there's the constraint that the permission check must be called or happen before the dangerous API. So API can analyze such calling order by computing the domination relation between this method. That is, uh, it will find where the uh, permission check dominates a dangerous API. If such property is break, then well, API will regard it as might have caused some ARP issues. And so for check API, it must dominate the dangerous API. But on the other hand, it cannot be called before it or they cannot be called in parallel. And API also deal with asynchronous call in the following way. For the inter callback management, we use the lifecycle model to describe their calling order. So under this lifecycle model, breaking the temporal order will result in ARP issues, ARP bugs. Yes, and to analyze intercomponent management type, we build the intercomponent communication graph. And so domination relation can be represented by edge on such graph. That is, if it, the permission is tracked in an, an, an in page and the permission use is in another page, there will be, a, if they they have a intercomponent communication. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I think we lost these slides. I think we did, and I think we're just about out of time. So then maybe you want to wrap up. Um, sorry? Maybe if there's a few words you want to say to uh, conclude your talk. We lost your slides, and I oh. think you're out of time. Sorry. If you have like a conclusion slide that you want to. Uh, yes, indeed, there is a conclusion. Mm. Sorry, can you see a slide now? Uh, I can, yes. Yes, sorry, seems my network is not so much. But then, okay. Then we, yes, I just, uh, just mentioned, April also will detect the compatibility issues by analyzing such random permission check. And so for the- um, if you could, I'm sorry to interrupt. We really have to move to the next talk. Um, so if you just have a conclusion slide, you can maybe oh, have okay. 10 seconds. <laughs> sorry, there's, yes, we, we uh, Here's how we evaluate a pro we run on set of F, uh, open source apps and from the app, these open source apps, we find um, like 84 bugs and we manually verify 34 of them. And this is some videos if you want to see. Uh, you can check this video from the long presentation in the XC official website. And so, so sorry for my, okay, that's all for my nope. No problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's uh, sometimes difficult to make the technology work. I very much understand. All right, uh, for our next talk, Sarah Mashari uh, will be presenting her paper on a grounded theory-based approach to characterize software attack surfaces. Yeah. Can you see my screen? I can. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Sarah Moshtari, a PhD student at Rochester Institute of Technology. My talk is about a grounded theory-based approach to characterize software attacks surface, and I work with Ahmed Wakutan and my advisor, Dr. Mira Kholi, on this paper. Software security is becoming a day-to-day -day concern. Therefore, different security analysis techniques, such as vulnerability detection and software testing, have been proposed to improve the security of software systems. These techniques often directly or indirectly rely on attack surface components. Attack surface refers to the critical points on the boundary of software that attacker used to get into system 
or critical parts of software that contain valuable content for attackers. An attack surface analysis is the process of identifying attack surface components. Most prior studies focused on vulnerability analysis rather than identifying attack surface components. There are few studies that elaborate on the notion of attack surface. These studies consider general concepts such as entry points, channels, as existing the theory and then try to validate them. And also they focus on example-based demonstration of attack surface, for example, attack surfaces of an operating system. The goal of this study is to develop a comprehensive attack surface model that can be used by researchers and security practitioners in different software analysis approaches. And we leverage a qualitative analysis approach to identify attack surface components. We define research questions by inspiring from attack surfaces of a house. The first research question is that where are the critical entry points in software system? The second one is what assets or components are targeted by attackers? And the third one is what types of mechanisms are utilized to reach the target? Therefore, we define research questions based on entry point, target, and mechanism. To answer this research, this research question, we use grounded theory which is a social science research method to identify concepts and theories which are related to attack surface from reported vulnerability. The grand theory process allows theory to emerge out of collected data. We perform a Thracian grand theory which encompasses different activities such as data collection, memoing, coding, constant comparison that were performed in different stages until we reached saturation. Then we defined, uh, then we sorted the defined concepts and proposed theories and taxonomies which are related to attack surface components. During the Thracian grand theory, we collected 810 vulnerabilities from common vulnerabilities and exposure repository. And for each vulnerability, we analyze description, patches, exploit, and advisor information. And in addition to that, we collected and analyzed 634 CWEs from Common Weakness Enumeration Repository. This is the taxonomy that we define for entry point as a result of the Strassian Grand Theory approach to answer the first research question. The concepts are categorized into four major categories, which are code, program, that is executable version of the code, and some concepts are related to system and network as environment that the application is running on. We provided the same categorization for target and mechanism based on code, program, system, and network level to answer the second and third research question. We conducted a systematic literature review to evaluate the proposed attack surface model, and the comparison results showed that the proposed model provides a comprehensive attack surface categorization at code, program, system, and network level. It defines clear concepts and provides comprehensive code level attack surface components. And uh, the result of quantitative comparison show that the literature covers a small percentage of code level attack surface component, which is on average 6.7%. And the proposed model introduces 254 new concepts related to attack surface components that didn't exist in the literature. In summary, in this study, we developed a comprehensive attack surface model based on entry points, targets, and mechanisms which covers all the concepts defined in the literature and introduces 254 new components related to attack surface. And the proposed model can be used in different software analysis approaches. For example, developers can use that during secure coding reviews to identify critical parts of software. Or for, for instance, testers can use that to prioritize their testing activities. Thank you for your attention.
I would be happy to answer your question. And if you have any more questions, you can contact me via my email. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Next up, we have David Reed, who will present the extent of orphan vulnerabilities from code reuse in open source software. Thank you, Travis. Uh, my name is David Reed from the University of Tennessee, and I'm working on getting my... There we go. We see it. We see it. All right. Uh, our work is motivated by the security vulnerabilities and other bugs that are propagated through code reuse. I'm having just slight technical difficulty. There we go. Um, we specifically looked at cases where the uh, security vulnerabilities are introduced into a project. It is copied and committed into other projects. It's then reported and fixed in the original project. And then the fix is not propagated to the projects that copied it, often because there is no link from the child project back to the parent. Now, we coined this term orphan vulnerability to describe that specific case. In some cases, the copying is the result of forking, and the link to the original code is readily available. In other cases, especially when the copying is a result of many iterations, the link to the original code may not exist. Uh, but either way, the vulnerability is publicly exposed until the orphan vulnerability is fixed or removed. We wanted to study the extent of the problem, its impact, and how to mitigate the risk. And we wanted to study that over as complete a collection of open source software as possible. Our aim is to create an efficient way to detect this kind of vulnerability caused by code reuse, see how prevalent it is, and explore how the risks might be mitigated. We leverage the world of code infrastructure to build a tool to identify code reuse over a nearly complete collection of open source software. Now, I don't have time to uh, explain the world of code in detail, but basically it contains uh, nearly all open source software in a form that makes research on this scale possible. Using our tool, we conducted a case study of several known security vulnerabilities in popular projects. The result uh, was that we found many cases um, tens of thousands of cases even, where vulnerabilities that have been found and fixed still persist in projects that are using copies of that code. Now, some of these projects are inactive or they're just forks, uh, but many are, uh, are very active and highly popular projects. Uh, we provided patches to some of these projects and found that only a small percentage of project maintainers uh, accepted and applied our patch. Our contributions are that we provide a working approach to find file level exact copy code reuse in any language across all open source repositories. We provide a tool to implement our approach and we conduct a case study with four cases to answer our research, research questions regarding vulnerabilities that are spread by a code reuse. Our tool, uh, which we named Vidios for vulnerability detection in open source, finds these orphan vulnerabilities. It's an application layer tool that builds on the world of code infrastructure, which allows videos to find duplicate files at a scale that traditionally has been computationally infeasible. Given a, vulnerable, a vulnerability fix in one project, videos can identify other projects that still contain the vulnerable code, or that used to contain the vulnerable code, but now it's been fixed, or that used to contain the vulnerable code, it's been modified, but we're not sure if it's been fixed or not. Now, the benefits here are to inform maintainers and users of still vulnerable projects about the risks of the vulnerability in their code and to warn users that are contemplate reusing such code about these unpatched vulnerabilities. Now, I don't have time to cover all the results, but in one of our four cases, we looked at a vulnerability in a very popular graphics library that was fixed several years earlier, and we found tens of thousands of projects that still contain a vulnerable, a vulnerable version of one of those files. Now, if we, a lot of those are just forked projects, but looking at deforked projects, there were about 10,000. Now, a lot of them appeared to be inactive, uh, although even inactive projects could still be copied and reused, but some of the projects were very popular. We found more than 25 that had more than 10,000 stars on GitHub and over 100 with more than 1,000 stars. And these kind of vulnerabilities are not found by tools like Dependabot, 
that look for uh, dependency manager kind of vulnerabilities. We also found that very few project maintainers accepted and applied the patch that we provided. That was a little bit disappointing. So we found that copying vulnerable code is common, that the copied code is often not fixed when the vulnerability is found and fixed in the original project from where it was copied, and that many project maintainers do not fix the vulnerability even when supplied with a patch. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next up, we have Sitsong Zhao, who will present MBD, Memory Related Vulnerability Detection Based in Flow Sensitive Graph. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Tong Zhao. I'm a PhD candidate in Yangzhou University. It's my honor to share our latest work, MVD, here. Memory related vulnerabilities can result in performance degradation and perform crash, severely threatening the security of modern software. As reported in CW Top 25 vulnerabilities in 2021, top, two of top three vulnerabilities are related to improper memory operations. Despite the effectiveness of static analyzed approaches, well defined vulnerability patterns are highly dependent on expert knowledge and difficult to cover all the cases. What's worse, the complex programming logic in real world software projects gets in the way of the manual identification of the rules. Recently, benefit from the powerful performance of deep learning, a number of approaches have been proposed to leverage deep learning models to extract implicit vulnerability patterns from vulnerable code. However, Existing deep learning based approaches suffer from two limitations. The first is flow information under utilization. Due to the lack of inter procedural analysis, most of deep learning based approaches may fail to mine precise program semantics. For example, operations like calling a user defined function call, which realizes memory allocation of free, are well spread. The second problem is partial flow information are lost in model training. Limited by the capability of popular deep learning models in handling multiple relations, partial information is lost during the process of model training. Another limitation is code granularity. The, det the detection granularity of the existing deep learning based approaches is mostly at the function level or slice level. However, developers will still need to at, uh, spend a deal of time to uh, in manually narrowing down the range of suspicious statements or operations. Therefore, we can find that comprehensive and precise interprocedural flow analysis is necessary because it can make our detection model learn more precise code semantics. In addition, sensitive contextual information within flows helps to refine detection granularity. The workflow of our approach MVD is shown as follows. To train the detection model, MVD first extends the program dependence graph with additional semantic information like correlations and return values obtained from core graph to construct interprocedural analyze. Furthermore, to reduce irrelevant semantic noise, MVD conducts program slicing from the program points of interest. In step two, MVD uses doc 2 vec to transform the statements of each slice into low dimensional vector representations. In step three, MVD uses flow sensitive graph neural networks. Here we called FSGN to jointly embedded nodes and relations to learn implicit vulnerability patterns and rebalance distribution. For the detection phase, we repeat step one and step two and use the well-defined uh, model for detection. Okay, we focus on step three, graph learning part, to train a detection model which can learn implicit vulnerability patterns. We construct a novel graph learning framework flow sensitive graph network. In the graph embedding phase, we leverage the entity relation composition operations to jointly embed statements nodes and multiple flow edges incorporate edge embedding into the update of node information. Then we adopt weighted inner production to generate edges and gives link predictions for synthetic nodes by setting a threshold to keep the connectivity of the graph. 
Finally, to train the detection model, we use a softmax activation function as the last linear layer for node classification. We raised four research questions and Mary constructed a new vulnerability dataset contains 4,353 vulnerable samples covering 13 common memory related vulnerabilities for evaluation. For RQ1 and RQ2, MVT achieves better results and performance all of the three referred deep learning based approaches and static analyze based approaches. Moreover, in terms of all metrics, MVT can improve the best performed baseline divine by 5% to 12%. In ARC3, we conduct an application study by replacing our FSGN with other state of the art GN frameworks. Above that, FSGN can improve the best performed baseline RGCN by 6.8% to 14%. In ARC4, we account for the time cost in seconds of each approach in training and detecting vulnerabilities. In spite of a great deal of time, MVD achieves relatively shorter detection time with better detection results, making a trade-off between accuracy and efficiency. Okay, this is all of our work. Uh, in this work, we propose a new approach, MVD to detect memory-related vulnerabilities at the statement level. Then we conduct a comprehensive experiment and evaluation to uh, evaluate our approach. That's all my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Excellent. Thank you, Sitsong. Um, next up, I believe Wei Yang, are you presenting Vulcan? Am I saying that correctly? Vol CNN, an image inspired scalable vulnerability detection system. Yeah, I'll be presenting a paper. Yeah. Okay, just a. Uh, just a heads up. There's some audio in the back that might be uh, that might be a bit loud. Yeah, my kids were having difficulty sleeping. Okay, right it sounds now. great now. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, so bear with me. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Wei. Uh, I'm from UT Dallas. So this paper is actually led by uh, my college advice student uh, Yuan Wu. Uh, he was in uh, HUST in China back when working on the work. He's now graduated working uh, NTU in Singapore. So um, because deep learning can automatically learn features from source code, uh, there are many projects that have been proposed to apply uh, deep learning to detect source code vulnerability. So uh, we have shown some example here. <laughs> so those projects can be classified into four main categories. Uh, the token-based, the slice-based, the tree-based, and the graph-based methods. So among those approaches, graph-based methods can achieve better detection performance because they can maintain the program semantics of the source code. However, they cannot scale to big code due to the heavy weight time consumption of the graph analysis. Therefore, we raise a research question, which is how to make graph-based methods complete large-scale vulnerability scanning. So inspired by the existing deep learning-based image classification techniques, which can analyze millions of images accurately in a relatively uh, reasonable amount of time, we plan to use similar type of techniques to accomplish our purpose. Well, the challenge is how we can efficiently convert the source code of a function into a, an image format while preserving the program details. So uh, to address this challenge, we introduce uh, social network centrality analysis into deep learning based vulnerability detection. <coughs> So uh, let's first uh, introduce some uh, motivation or insight about our approach. So we all know that a function can consist of multiple lines of code, right? Uh, which together implement the program semantics. However, the importance of the code lines may differ. 
right? For example, some um, code is just a variable definition, while some code actually implement the core algorithm of the function. So to better preserve program semantics, we need to figure out how to find out the contribution of different lines of code in the function to the program semantics. Um, so then uh, we find a way. Um, how first we uh, encode this uh, example code in a PDG, program dependence graph, and we then use this uh, adjacency matrix to represent the PDG. The code lines degree uh, are illustrated in the right figure, which you can see obviously they are variant. Right? Uh, this is because of the different relationships between the different code lines. And we can actually utilize this to represent program. In practice, the degree of node in a graph is originally used to quantify its importance, which in this case may represent the importance of a line of a code. So therefore, we design our system of our CNN by analyzing the importance of all code lines. So next, I'll briefly uh, talk about system design. So Valsilian basically consists of four main phases, uh, graph extraction, sentence embedding, image generation, and classification. So first, we use um, centrality uh, um, measures. The centrality concepts were first developed in social network analysis, which quantify the importance of a node in the network. So here we utilize three different uh, centrality measures, uh, degree centrality, cat centrality, and closeness centrality. And in spite of the RGB channels of the image, we use these three centrality as the three ch channels to represent programs. And by doing this, we can achieve a more complete representation of these important code lines in functions pro um, program semantics. And after embedding all the code lines into this uh, RGB type of format, and we perform centrality analysis on all nodes in a new program dependence graph to collect their centrality. And we then multiply the vectors by the corresponding centrality, uh, here basically um, to construct these three channels. And finally, our form an image. And last part is our evaluation. Uh, we first collect the data set from start and another data set from NVD. And uh, for real world uh, non vulnerable functions, we just randomly select a uh, part of the data set in a recent paper, uh, which contains non vulnerable functions from several open source projects. And we then compare uh, our system with several vulnerability detection tools. Uh, we select three static analysis tools, five deep learning based vulnerability detection approaches. And moreover, we also add a version of Bell CNN that doesn't utilize the centrality um, uh, and consider it as kind of a baseline in the evaluation to see whether the centrality feature is really helping. And here, apparently, you can see uh, that the uh, Bell CNN, which is this brown bar, outperforms uh, those comparative systems. And finally, we perform a comprehensive evaluation on the runtime overhead of Valsian, which is actually one of the uh, claim or contributions we make. And um, so actually, you can see that the figure shows that Valsian is only less scalable as token CNN but a lot faster than other four approaches. Uh, and also considering our system is much more accurate than token CNN, uh, which shows the advantage of our system. Um, so that's all I want to uh, say about our paper. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you, Wei. Okay, well, uh, thank you for bearing with us, everybody. We've had a, a few delays here and there, but I think we finally wrapped up uh, our presentations. And now we can begin the Q&A portion of the session.
So if anybody has a question, uh, please feel free to step up. I can see there are some questions in the chat. Can I complete my answer? Yes, please. OK, thank you. And do you the mind question. repeating the question uh, just for everyone else? OK. Uh, the first question is about my paper, that uh, if we can use 3D fine catalyst polarization, as I explained in my presentation, there are few studies that elaborate the notion of attack surface. Uh, they use general concepts in different abstract levels as attack surface components. For example, they use data items could be an attack surface. But we clearly define that the data item could be in program or could be in system. For example, uh, System files, a specific file, can be a target of attack. Uh, therefore, we define clear concepts and define a complete categorization for each of them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David there as well. David, why do you think that people do not fix the problems in their projects i had a study published in tsc where we provided the project owners with a complete guide to their vulnerabilities but they did not fix them that's a great question unfortunately i don't have a great answer so uh, what we did we tried to make it really easy for them we forked the project we fixed the vulnerability and we issued a pull request so all they had to do was accept the pull request and about 10 percent did which means about 90% did not. Now, some of them were inactive projects. Nobody had touched the projects in two or three years. And so it wasn't too surprising in those cases that they didn't accept them. Uh, but some of them were you know, relatively new active projects and, and had people working on them, uh, didn't get any uh, responses. Or we, some, most of the time they just didn't respond. Sometimes they responded and said they weren't gonna apply the patch, but most of the time, no response. So what we wanted to do, we had this in our future work section and then we ran out of space. And so we took this out, but as future work, what we'd love to do is go back and survey uh, a bunch of people and see if we can understand why they would or would not accept the patches. So uh, the short answer is I don't have a good answer for why they didn't accept the patches. Thank you. And then we have a question for Wei. <clears throat> the question is how can code be presented as an image especially especially when in malicious codes we have obfuscations so we have several code samples all having similar functionality but different source codes am i right that adding a number of non-executable code lines can change the image yeah that's a very good question um i have to say that uh so uh, our system work uh, on the assumption that we have the source code and also, um, if there is an adversary trying to manipulate the result, uh, they can. Uh, but because we are aiming to detect vulnerable code, so usually for people who want to <clears throat> detect vulnerable code, they, um, they usually don't have such motivation. Uh, but yeah, I do agree that uh, if you want to um, change the functionality perform some refactoring or program transformation, yeah, the image could change completely. And we're actually leveraging that perspective uh, to try to improve our results uh, as a kind of a current work. <clears throat> so we are trying to do is to, uh, for those program, which we think is out of scope for the current uh, deep learning model, uh, we try to perform program transformation to convert them within the scope where the deep learning model can handle. 
Um, so in this way, we didn't change any semantics of the program, but uh, we make the deep learning model can handle, uh, better handle the code. Uh, but back to your question, yes, if it, if this project is used for a, a malicious code detection, then it probably won't work because malicious uh, code authors, they can um, have a lot of camouflage, and have a lot of obfuscation to make the code um, analyzable. Uh, but luckily, because we are here to uh, do vulnerability detection, so um, we our system should work. Uh, based on that, there is no motivation for those code authors to camouflage their vulnerability in their code. Okay. Thank you, and thank you, Ashkan. Two very good questions. If uh, anybody else has another question, you know, feel free to pop it in the chat, or if you want to ask it live, that is also an option. I know I've got a question in the meantime. Bowden, I wanted to ask you about your work. <clears throat> I thought it was uh, really fascinating. You were tracking vulnerabilities and the time it takes for developers to fix them. Um, somewhat similar to the question that was posed to David, I was wondering if you uh, had a chance to contact any package maintainers. There can be human factors that affect why security fixes might take longer or shorter amounts of time for a particular package. Um, is that something that came up or? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, actually, yeah, similar to David, in, in our work, we didn't uh, looking at the human aspect. So we just try to see like the behaviors of uh, the developers to the repository mining so we didn't check whether like the reason why they didn't uh respond to uh the vulnerability fixes yeah so right now we just yeah so i think that's still like is a gap to to be looking at further more like why people doesn't uh doesn't adopt like the fix like quickly. I actually, I remember that there's some works like do 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 kind of a survey that shake shaking whether why they didn't update their dependency, but it's not specifically related to the, uh, the, the vulnerability just for the updates. I think one of the reason is that they don't they don't want to touch that code because the current code is already working if they try to update something they might break that code yeah maybe that's one of the reason i guess but that that is just for the general general one not for vulnerability specific interesting so maybe maybe some future work and uh it sounds like your technique would give you some guidance in how to select packages to contact because there are packages with lag and there are packages without lag. So it'd be nice to hear uh, examples from both. All right, any questions surface like in the meantime there or do any of the presenters have questions for other presenters? Okay, may, maybe I have some question to uh, weigh. So, so as uh, the technique that you try to uh, represent the code as the image, is there like, is it possible to, there are another representation for for the code and use like uh, your technique to identify the vulnerability in the source code and yeah get like some similar result to your current work like is it possible? Yeah, I think uh, definitely uh, there are 
uh, many related work. Uh, they use different type of representation. <laughs> the reason why we say like we encode the code as a type of image format is that we want to reuse uh, many of the system um, in this image classification domain. And also because we noticed that a lot of work in vulnerability detection, um, they consume a lot of time because sometimes they perform uh, heavy weight uh, static analysis, right? So we want to avoid those heavy weight static analysis to really um, in, enhance the scale that the vulnerability detection system can handle, the scale of the code that the vulnerability detection system can handle. Yeah, so to answer your question, yes, we can use our representation. Uh, well, the reason we haven't used that is because we want to really um, exert the power of existing image classification system. So we just trying to see just by reusing those image classification technique, what we can do. But of course, um, there's a lot of uh, room to develop a customized technique for uh, code representation. And uh, there are already uh, tons of work going on in that domain. Um, but we haven't uh, really uh, reached that level in this work. Um, yeah, thank you. I, can I ask a question? Uh, I actually have a question for Sarah. Um, I find your work very interesting. Uh, I'm wondering if people can use your work to turn the uh, current CVE uh, document in a structured data set. So, and then people can use whatever like ontology or things like that to analyze the vulnerability document in a structural way? Uh, yeah, you mean that we can pro uh, provide a representation for vulnerabilities based on the categorization that I provided? Yeah, well, uh, the reason why I ask is because I'm trying to envision, because you mentioned entry point and other entities, I'm trying to envision a natural language description of the vulnerability can have a direct mapping on the code, on the code uh, which are vulnerable. So with your work, maybe it's possible to perform such mapping from the natural language description and the code itself to see uh, where's the trigger and where the, uh, where's the other component of the vulnerability. Yes, that's a good point that you mentioned. And also what uh, I'm thinking about is to provide a representation based on the uh, categorization that we provided. As you know, CVs have different unstructured data. For example, description, patches, and it is hard for developers or security practitioners to identify the root cause and fix the problem. But if they know the important part, for example, the entry point or part of the code that is target of attack, it is easier to fix the vulnerabilities. Uh, yes, that's a good point that you mentioned. Thanks, thanks for your answer. All right, so I think we have one minute left and I do want to uh give Sitsong a chance to respond to Francois's question. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to see that in the chat. The question is, if I understand correctly in your evaluation, MVD is trained on some versions of a program such as Linux kernel and tested on others. Isn't that unfair to static analysis tools that don't benefit from this domain specific knowledge? Have you tried training on one program and testing on another? Yes, uh, I have tried our MVD in various programs, uh, not only Linux kernel. We uh, we use FFMP, uh, PG or other uh, C or C++ programs. And uh, actually, 